welcome everybody and thank you for joining us this evening for Strider's professional development webinar series. Um, we're so excited tonight to be joined by Frankie Terriot Stutz, who is joining us from the West Coast. Um, and we are going to learn all about sponsorship and sponsor relations. Uh, Frankie has years of experience in this area. She has um, created and built up athletics which is a comprehensive marketing company that many of you are familiar with. Um, Frankie is also a very well awarded rider in eventing. Um, she and her horse Chatwin sort of stormed around at the CCI four star level um, and have some great accomplishments under their belts. And uh, Frankie is also a well known um, TV uh, sportscaster. So you've probably seen her on USEF Network, Horse and Country TV, um, and some other networks there. So Frankie, with that, I will hand it over to you and thank you so much again. Oh, one housekeeping piece. Um, we're going to do a Q&A at the end, but if everybody doesn't mind, just either save your questions for the end and we will submit them all um, through the chat and I will sort of moderate the Q&A at the end. You can, if you're, if something comes to mind as Frankie's moving through her slides, go ahead and just drop them in the chat and I will read them at the end. Cool, all right, well, thank you so much. And Frankie, over to you. Okay, hi everybody, thanks so much for having me and hope you're having a good night so far. Um, so I just wanted to jump on in with um, kind of a brief agenda of what we'll chat about today. I'll give you a bit, little bit more information about myself and athletics. Um, and then we'll discuss without wanting to throw way too much info at you, but some things that you can hopefully take away from this and feel like you have a few good kind of things for your agenda or bullet points to go off of um, and let you answer questions, obviously. So we'll look at what you can offer a sponsor, how to acquire a sponsor, and then how to be a great rider, a sponsored rider once you have sponsors, because I think that's an important piece and something that people overlook. Uh, which tends to make it not as possible to have long-standing relationships, which is really the goal um, to have mutually beneficial relationships for the long term with those sponsors. And then obviously um, do some Q&A at the end. So we will jump right in. Um, to give you a little bit of history on athletics, thanks so much, Natasha, for the intro. Um, athletics, I started about a decade ago and um, over the years, we've been fortunate to help hundreds of riders and hundreds of brands and kind of work alongside both of them um, in a variety of capacities, um, as well as with a variety of big organizations like USEF and, um, you know, the FEI and things like that uh, from a consulting standpoint. So now our business is really broken into a couple of different sectors, really with services for the brand, for the rider and for the event. Uh, so for the brand, we obviously are one of the longest running agencies in the equine business that does this. And we're proud to have worked, as I said, with hundreds of brands. Um, and what we really do for those brands is we do a tremendous amount of consulting, but we also offer monthly services where we really help with social media, but also with their sponsored rider relations, because it's really something that over the years we found that brands struggle with having somebody full time to do sponsored rider relations. And really through that process, we've learned kind of what brands are looking for in terms of the riders they choose to be with, um, in terms of their ambassadors, who they choose, why they choose them, you know, maybe, and we'll get into that in a minute, kind of where they're located, all sorts of things come into play. But, um, you know, for the brands, we also do email marketing. Um, and then, you know, advising, like I said, I do a tremendous amount of advising for, for different brands, helping maybe they have someone to manage their social media in-house, but they need somebody to come in and say like, yes, no, do this, don't do that. This looks like a great uh, sponsored writer program. Have you thought about this or do more ambassadors on this side or things like that um, and be an extra set of eyes. And then we do some um, graphic design work and email marketing for brands as well. So on the brand side, that's kind of how we look. On the rider side, um, we customize our services and packages to fit their needs because we feel like no two programs are really the same. So we do a lot of social media, help with syndication, uh, advising, sponsorships, PR, fundraising, advertising, crisis management, 
grant applications, email marketing, promotion, website stuff. So kind of you name it, we do it on that side of things. Um, and then from an event standpoint, uh, we do some PR stuff, sponsorship, procurement and help, um, live stream commentary and, you know, video production, broadcasting. Um, as Natasha said, I've done a tremendous amount of broadcast work myself. Um, and so we kind of do that for different events, depending on what their needs are, which it can be a lot of fun. So that kind of gives you a quick synopsis. Myself, I've been a rider for my whole life. Um, I was shortlisted for Tokyo with my horse Chatwin um, and he got hurt during the COVID break and I'm, you can't tell on this screen, but I'm eight and a half months pregnant. So um, <laughs> I am uh, not going to Tokyo needless to say, but feel very fortunate to also kind of understand the, the rigorous um, implications of being a rider at the top level and kind of what that can mean. And I think, you know, everyone on my team also is a rider themselves and has industry experience in that standpoint. So we really understand that from, you know, your guys' standpoint when you're trying to get sponsors and stuff like that, which I'll go into in a second, you know, there's a lot of stuff that comes into play and any products and things you're able to procure help your bottom line, um, you know, and offset your costs that can be so, so expensive in this industry. So that is a little about athletics and myself. Jumping right in, I wanted to spend some time today kind of talking about when I think with clients about getting sponsorships, I really start by saying, you know, what can you offer a sponsor? And those things, it's great to think outside the box. They're different for everybody. So you have a different set of tools and things you can offer a brand than the person sitting next to you. And it's really important to think about that. And First and foremost, my number one thing when thinking about sponsors that I always tell people is think about the brands you use and love in your barn every day. If you go to the barn tomorrow and you make a list of the products you're using, I guarantee you that about 40% of them, you don't even think about using them. You're just using them all the time. Um, and you know, that could be the girth you use, the vitamins you feed your horse, the mats that your horse is standing on, all these little things. And if you are starting with a list of brands you use and love, if you're able to form a relationship with those brands, you're guaranteed to be a better sponsored rider in the long run, because they're already the ones you believe in rather than seeking out, as I call it, just extra stickers for your horse trailer, if that makes sense. It's better to have less brands that you work with and have it be a killer relationship than just, you know, hear them saying, here's a saddle pad. And now you've been asked to do all of these things. And it was a saddle pad you didn't love to start with. So that's really kind of how I start honing in on where to start in terms of going after sponsors. Then we come back to this slide, what you can offer a sponsor. So do you have, these are just some questions to ask yourself, but do you have a strong social media presence? Does you, do you have a successful track record? That would be in terms of, you know, being able to list out wins or, you know, Top, only rider in the world to win to, you know, CCI four star longs in a year. Like what are those things for your past and current that you can, you can point out? Um, so client base. I think that a lot of people don't spend the time to think or stress this to brands. And really this, I would say is more important to brands than if you have a successful track record. Do you have a barn where you teach 45 adult amateur women and they are absolutely open and listening to the products you use and believe in are you going to be able to convert your barn to them then then the brand needs to know about that because to me selling a product that is very very interesting and very very important and really what a lot of these brands are looking for it's great to have you know a top name but you want to sell your product at the end of the day for these brands so that's something to point out. Um, and then location, are you in a unique location, especially if you're, you know, located in an area where maybe there's not, it's not so incredibly populated with barns. That's important too, from a standpoint of these companies being able to 
kind of get feet on the ground and sell products. So those are just some ideas of things that you're going to want to highlight when you contact them. Um, but think of yourself and think of, you know, what are the things that set you apart from the person next to you? And I guarantee you there's things for everybody. Some people will say, oh, I'm just, nothing comes to mind, but there definitely are things. And you want to kind of sell yourself when you contact these sponsors. Um, and I just put this slide in again to reiterate, you know, be you, everyone else is taken, but um, we talked about, you know, what brands you use and love on a daily basis. I can't stress that enough, starting there and then branching out from there on, on who you want to contact. Um, and I think too, again, you know, what are the things that, that set you apart and your business apart really, because that's super, super important. Um, now you have figured out kind of how or who you want to contact, or at least a starting point of who to contact. So now how do you contact them, which is very important. So when thinking about contacting a sponsor, I suggest always putting together um, an email first and trying to find their contact information. So you've established a list of people you want to contact or brands you want to contact. Then you're going to want to, in a professional manner, contact them. So if you can't find their contact information on their website for the marketing department, you can call and it's totally fine to call and say, hi, I'm, you know, hoping to speak with someone in your marketing department and try to get a name if you can that you're going to email. If you can't, LinkedIn is actually a great way to go about trying to hone in on finding a particular person and social media you can always always send a DM and ask, say, you know, is there someone in your marketing department would be possible to contact and looking to contact them about a marketing opportunity. So once you have that, then you want to, let's see what my next slide is. You want to um, kind of establish your list of contacts and then you're gonna start writing an email for each contact um, to shoot them off some information about yourself, kind of why they might wanna work with you and really want to sell yourself in that paragraph that you're going to send them in the email and then attach a little bit more information is what I always suggest. And then what can happen to us as we think, oh, okay, I love this boot company. I'm going to contact them. But then I don't know about you guys, but for me, all the weeks kind of blend together here and there. <laughs> so especially now in the world. Um, and so what I suggest is creating an Excel document or even notes in your phone or whatever's easiest for you and saying, for example, you know, I contacted Tucci Boots on 615 and just make a little note to yourself so that if it, in about a week you haven't heard back, I would suggest following up again. And sometimes it can take 10 times of following up before you hear back. And that is not necessarily a reflection on you. I'd like to reiterate, it can be anything. A lot of the people at these companies making these decisions are so busy and they just haven't looked through their email. And we have a lot of brands and companies that reach out to us about writers we're contacting them for and say, thank you for being persistent and following up. We really are serious about working with this rider. Um, even some of our riders who've been named to the Olympic team for different disciplines, we're contacting them to finalize a few deals for a couple of things before they leave for Tokyo. And some of the like a boot company, for example, we've emailed 10 times and they finally got back and they were like, oh my gosh, yes, we missed this the other nine times. We're sorry. So it just kind of a bit the nature of the beast. So make sure you have a way to note when you contacted them and follow up. So in your pitch to them, you really want to be creative. Like we talked about, think about, um, you know, what you really want in terms of the brands you're contacting, but also really in terms like, what are you hoping to come out of the situation? And a lot of times, you know, if that's a discount on product or if it's full sponsorship, or, you know, I try to be a bit vague in the initial contact and just say, you know, something along the lines of, hi, my name's Frankie. And I wanted to reach out because I've been a true believer and fan of your product for 10 years, you know, using it your bonnets uh, don't come close to the quality and et cetera of any of the other ones I've tried on the market. Um, you know, everyone, I've converted tons of people in my barn to these because I truly believe they're the best in the industry. 
And I would love the opportunity to speak with you further about how I feel, you know, my barn can grow your uh, following as well as, you know, as well as ideas I have for being able to sell your product for you um, locally in New Mexico or whatever it may be. Um, but really in these emails, you want to have a particular pitch that mentions their brand, why you love it, and, you know, put in some key points about you and your business of why they want to learn more. Then one of the things I see super often um, is that when I actually started athletics years ago, I was getting ready to take a horse to Kentucky and I was working in corporate communications. And when I was contacting some brands that year to support us in our journey um, to Kentucky, I was overwhelmed by how many brands said, yes, we'll work and support you. And it got me thinking, what was I doing differently? Because I was just one rider going to Kentucky, retiring the horse after I didn't have a big barn. There wasn't, I didn't think a ton of reasons why these brands should be wanting to work with me. But I realized that I was putting it together in a format that made sense to me from a corporate communication standpoint. That was a lot more than, hi, my name's Frankie. I ride horses. Will you sponsor me? And so you have to realize one of the biggest things that I've seen happen at these companies time and time again is the people that are getting this material, even if you're a top writer that you think they should have heard of a hundred times, chances are they haven't. And a lot of times more and more now we're seeing in the equine industry that the executives and people, the information is getting passed along to some of these brands. They might not live and breathe in your discipline, or they might not live and breathe in equine sports at all. Some of them are getting brought in, over from other um, areas and other you know, marketing professions all together, to be honest. So it's very important to take the time to put something professional together. You can attach that email. This is just one example. Um, this is what I'd call one page. It's obviously a cover and one page, but just you know, some basic information that is like, a little bit about Lauren in this case, career highlights, why they would want to work with her. Um, and so, you know, this is really an important thing to include. It doesn't have to look just like this. Um, sometimes we include, I include full marketing packets that talk about the sport. Um, you know, what's, why be involved in sponsorship or, you know, what sets you apart or about your business or, you know, depending on what it is, particularly like I talked about before, but something you can attach to it that makes you stand out. And, and so for me, if somebody passed this on to somebody who didn't know anything kind of about her, um, then, and this is a rider obviously that went to Rio and is going back to the games, um, in Toronto or excuse me, in Tokyo, but, um, you know, again, if you've never heard about this, it gives you a quick synopsis and allows you to think, well, yeah, maybe we do need to look into this rider more. But this can be for someone not going to the Olympics. It can be, you know, just about your brand or business. Again, it's a, it's a selling tactic and it really is worth including. Um, another thing that I recommend along these same lines real quick is you can also do things like if you have a curry comb, that you love and you wanna contact the curry comb company, one of the things you can do is just do a short clip of yourself with the curry comb and say, it doesn't have to be professional and you know, have a clean shirt on, but you know, like professional grade video, video just use your iPhone, um, say, you know, hi, my name is Frankie and this is my horse, Bob. And I wanted to show you a quick, you know, video of why I love your curry comb. And I believe that your product is really top notch far and above anything else on the market and send almost a testimonial video with it because that can be a great, great option as well. Then um, let's talk about you've, you've contacted these companies, you've followed up, you've talked to them, they've given you an offer. You said, yes, I'd love to work with you. They've sent you product. Now what? Um, so how to be a great sponsored rider. I think it's hugely, hugely important. Typically they'll send a contract along um, or some kind of give gets as I call it for ambassadors. And I always suggest that you go 
above and beyond what those are. So you really want to, if they're asking for four pictures, send 12. If, you know, it's important for them that you're interacting on your social media platforms, both on your own page and tagging them, but also going to their page and, and writing a review or, you know, things like that. Like think what would help them sell because at the end of the day, those are all things that are going to make you a great sponsored writer. And you want relationships that are going to last and companies you can work with for the long term. So some of the things you can do, like I mentioned, like share and comment on their posts, um, you know, interact with them as much as you can via social. And then a quick, you know, what to do and what not to do <laughs> for people. So you do want to post, uh, interact, represent, research, communicate, and abide. Those are all things that pertain to like the contract of what they've sent over. And you don't want to be, you know, inappropriate, unprofessional, promote com competitors or brands, you know, that compete with theirs, promote false information, um, ghost. So in other words, just disappear <laughs> um, or break contract. And along these same lines, one of the things I'd recommend doing is um, you know, I suggest all the writers I advise to do, if you've had a big show or, you know, a big event at your farm or whatever it is, the Monday after or whatever day works for you, set yourself some reminders to reach out to the brands you work with and just say, you know, hi, Susie, I wanted to let you know we had a great event this weekend. I've attached some photos, wanted to thank you for being such a great brand to work with. Uh, we are so excited to use our births this weekend, you know, everyone in the barn, love the look of them, yada, yada, yada. So just some things that even if they don't reach out to you, that you're kind of continuing to send along stuff they can use. I've had sponsors of my own that honestly, I send them pictures and I never even hear back, but then the pictures appear on their social media. And if you're sending these via email and you're sending these communications, then if a rep is switched and you're working with a certain rep, I've seen it a million times where then you kind of also have proof that you are over communicating and, you know, sending them great content and being a great sponsored writer and ambassador. If, you know, the company is to um, relook at everybody again um, at some point down the road. So, and then, you know, obviously when you're representing a brand in any capacity, you know, representing your business, really, you want to also think about your personal um, profiles because those are also a reflection of your company or your, your equine business and in turn a reflection of the companies that you work with. So that's really important and sometimes, you know, people can forget that as well. Um, I see it, especially with like some of the young professionals I advise, but just always keeping that in mind is really, really helpful and reaching out from time to time to just say to these brands, you know, Hey, what can I do for you? Is there anything I can send over that's helpful content? Um, think outside the box with them. And that really tends to, to go really, really far in asking, you know, how can I help? Or are you guys running any promos or is there anything like that, that I can assist with, or do you need a short video clip or anything along those lines? So yeah, those are kind of some do's and don'ts. Um, questions. I know everybody's business um, and their needs are very, very unique. And I really kind of understand that. And, and I know that everybody's unique business and needs come with different questions. So I'm super open to anything you want to ask. There's no dumb questions. Well, thank you, Frankie. That was awesome. Um, super like valuable bite-sized information. I feel like it was all really great and easy to absorb. So thank you. Um, there were a couple of questions that came through the chat. Um, one of which was, are there categories of sponsorship that you see? So like, you know, do, do people sort of tend to get sponsored by like a company that has pitchforks and a company that has, you know, saddle pads or whatever, like the various categories, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that obviously varies by brand. I will say what we've seen more and more now in the U S 
is that there are companies that are representing a lot of brands. So for example, World Equestrian Brands is one you guys might be familiar with, and they have a ton of different brands under their umbrella. So that might be like Amerigo Saddles and uh, Sergio Grosso Boots and, um, you know, a different bridal company and little things like that. And so really what those brands are looking for when they represent all these different brands is ambassadors who can fill as many of their products as possible. So there's definitely, we, we see that, but then I still see tons and tons of companies who are, um, you know, a supplement company that just has, um, you know, an electrolyte or just has a vitamin E supplement, for example, you want to be careful with some of those brands. I would caution that a sponsorship with a product like a vitamin E supplement, you want to be careful that that's not going to limit you if you still need to fill kind of the void of all the, the products you need in your barn in terms of supplements, that that's not going to get in the way of those, um, if that makes sense. So you know, yeah. there'll be like a magnesium supplement I've seen. And then, you know, someone will come in and they'll want to do all the horse's vitamins and provide a supplement sponsorship, but the magnesium might be a conflict of interest because they also have a magnesium product. So the best thing you can do in those circumstances is really, you know, figure out the brands you love. Sometimes a parent, parent company or a company in the U.S. might be managing multiple brands. Um, excuse me. And um, in that circumstance, what you can do is you just want to, you know, forge the best relationships you can with those existing brands and then kind of go from there. So there's really nothing you can do about them. I would just take them one at a time. And, yeah. um, but there are parent companies where, you know, if you go to World Equestrian Brands, you'll see all the brands they have. And if you're in the door with one of their products, you could then ask about um, a secondary product. And you run into that a lot also with um, riders who have a lot of sponsors, then it gets a little harder to kind of fill the last few little voids without stepping over into any other categories that might mix and match. Absolutely. Um, so there were two questions that came in that were really similar. So I, I'll okay. phrase them as like a two-parter. Um, so the first part is why do you think sponsors only offer or mostly offer products in our sport and not cash like other sports? And then the second one is, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward to ask for products. Um, but if you're looking for a cash sponsorship for something like an event or, you know, even like a business venture of some, some sort, how do you frame that appropriately? Um, so I think they're very separate in this. So <laughs> the first part in terms of why do I think that we don't see more cash sponsorships, I'll be very candid and straightforward. And that I think the equine industry we've shot ourselves in the foot largely in that regard, um, because you see so many people, for example, even with saddles or with things that are willing to take like loan, they don't even actually own the saddles at the end of the deal. And so many people are willing to settle in that regard that why would a company give you more than that? Um, so that is one of the ways to answer that question. Uh, what we've done is with uh, some of our riders, um, depending on like kind of the caliber of rider, what they've accomplished, things like that, we've gone above and beyond and said like, we'll do um, product, we require product sponsorships, but then we also um, require cash incentive bonuses. So if you place in the top three out of, you know, five star, um, you get a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars or whatever on top of all your product allotment. Um, but I think that the equine industry, quite frankly, that's become the industry norm because everyone's willing to take that. And my husband was a professional baseball player, and I actually did a lot of sponsorship stuff with a lot of other athletes, mainstream athletes in my kind of previous life, I'll call it. And those guys aren't willing to even talk about it for anything but money. If you want to send them product, you can go ahead all day long, but 
that's the industry norm. Nobody's doing it. They take less cash. And so, um, unfortunately the equine industry largely has been willing to settle and it's, you know, a slippery slope from there, but that's why you see it so much in other mainstream sports. So I've worked a lot in, in mainstream sports and, um, you know, there's not, there's not even a conversation if it doesn't include um, monetary compensation, usually. It is crazy how the horse world sort of operates in this like funky little parallel, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it definitely does, but it's just, it's, it's a bummer because, you know, even if you hold out with a saddle deal and you say you have to actually give us physically three saddles a year that belong to us that we own that aren't loaners, the person next to you is like, sure, just send over the loaners. <laughs> so um, it's a, it's tricky. It's definitely tricky. Um, and then in terms of event sponsorships and things yeah, like that, or even um, just, even just asking, you know, asking for cash, like, how do you present that question? Because the industry is this way. Yeah. So, I mean, we would say just like, I kind of phrased it before, you know, here's what the rider would be willing to do. And then, um, they'd also, you know, uh, be, be willing to sign on with you guys for cash um, incentive performance-based bonuses. Um, but if, I think the event stuff is very different. We put together for events that are seeking monetary sponsorship from brands, uh, different categories. And I think the give get becomes hugely important then. Um, so, you know, for $5,000, you have $5,000 in cash and here's what you get. Um, for that five grand in terms of recognition for your brand, in terms of, you know, making it worth it. You can be on live stream. You're going to have this, that, and the other, um, and having it be in packages where there's a clear give versus get. Yeah, that's really, and I think laying it out probably the way that, you know, you laid out the Lauren Billy's example is great and really helpful, especially if you're asking for money to back it up with sort of Mm -hmm. stuff. Do you think that companies up front, so there have been a couple of questions that came through about as a professional, like having a track record, or I'm assuming this means a competition record to gain sponsors. Mm -hmm. Do you think that social media metrics or email metrics or anything like that can also boost your chances in seeking sponsorship? Like, do yeah, you think that I they're definitely. of equal importance, more important than having, you know, I was the regional champion at blah, 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 blah to your name? I think they're different. I think that social media has become equally as important, if not, you know, more important to a lot of brands. Um, I'm seeing a lot of brands now that, you know, don't even want to consider riders if they don't have 10,000 followers type thing. But, but what I'm also really seeing is, I think the point of that and like in my slide on that was just that you have to kind of decide what your selling factors are. There's a lot of top, top riders that I have a couple I know that going to the Olympics and they have like 3000 followers on social media. They just don't love social media um, and they have great brand products. But I think brands are looking at people nowadays in two forms. There's a marketing form. Um, in terms of that, they're going to be able to use that name and likeness of your image and um, you know, be able to kind of push out to their channels that they work with you and you stand behind their product. And then there's, uh, wanting to get ambassadors that really are good at selling products. And I think those people, they don't even really have to have much of a track record. They have, you know, a huge social media following. And those are the ones that are actually becoming quickly more appealing to companies than, um, than the ones who are able to deliver on game day at the shows. Um, yeah. But I think yeah. They're separate and, and you mentioned, you mentioned, you know, the trainers with the barns full of riders who could yeah. get their riders to convert to the products. I think that that's really valuable as well. I think that's hugely valuable. And a lot of times people with a great track record don't have as big a barns because they're focused on their track record, you know? So obviously if you can get everyone together, um, then that's ideal for brands. But I think that if you're able to sell yourself property and you are properly, excuse me, and you have one or two of those categories, like you have, you know, I have a rider advise and she has a hundred thousand followers on TikTok, and brands are all over it. Um, you know, but that's the main selling point in contacting brands on her behalf.
I can't hear you. Well, that's because I oh, muted myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so one really great question came through here and it's how's the, or what is the best way to begin to reach out to a company that might not know much about eventing or equestrian sports, for example, an electric bike brand? Yeah, so we've actually, it's funny, I, we've actually partnered with two electric bike companies and gotten a huge amount of our riders sponsored by them. So it's a good question. Um, That's a really good question. <laughs> yeah, and we uh, we go about it really, I suggest then creating another page or a couple pages with a packet that's kind of really about, about the sport um, and kind of the demographics and why it'd be helpful for a company to get involved uh, with those demographics, you know, about, you know, just the, the things we don't think about because we know them, but these people would kind of need to be educated on. So you'd want to include that and also include some information about that in your pitch. For example, you know, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the sport of three-day eventing. Uh, we think it'd be a great fit for your product. Um, you know, a tremendous amount, there's a tremendous need for these bikes in the sport. And, you know, I can demonstrate that if you guys are willing to send me a bike and, um, you know, have some marketing ideas if you send a bike and, and maybe do a discount code, I can, you know, show how that could, could be the case. Yeah, that's really smart. I never would have thought of that, but like, that's what everybody's buzzing around with at the yeah. shows and stuff. Yeah. So, so smart. Um, okay. So two more kind of quick ones. Um, so obviously COVID was a, a bit of a tough year. Like I know I heard from a lot of event organizers that their sponsors were getting pulled again, like things were getting canceled left and right. Sponsors mm -hmm. were sort of pulling back on that, um, cash flow and, and product flow to shows. Did that happen for riders or like, what are some tips to maybe keep those relationships going when sponsorship money was tight? Or did well, you I see think, that again? You know, also? I think not related to even COVID, but like you just always want to be doing things that when your brand, the brands you work with at the end of the year comes and looks down the list of names, you want them to know who you are um, and follow up and that's why I mentioned those emails and reach out. And so then I don't think you're seeing that happen to those. I think if the riders who did that, they weren't getting dropped because yeah. they were yeah. in the forefront and it's really hard to get rid of a rider that, you know, is contributing to your brand. I will say with the equine industry as a whole, um, 85 to 95% of the companies I work with ended the COVID year um, having the best year they've ever had in the history of their business. So from a monetary perspective, and I can give you, I could give a hundred examples, um, like companies that have been in business for a very, very, very long time, having the best years they've seen in record numbers. So something about COVID with all these horse people being home, it was very actually good on that regard for the industry. I think speaking to, um, to the event side of a lot of things getting pulled, that was definitely, in my opinion, a reaction and a, a result of a lot of events canceling and not having a backup plan for how they were still gonna promote those brands or brands getting scared that the events will have to cancel or would have to cancel and not having a plan that says, if you sign on as a $10,000 sponsor of my event, here's our plan. And if for any reason we do have to cancel or we can't have people in person, we have this plan that is still gonna make your dollars worthwhile or we're gonna refund them, like those things. And I think a lot of events really failed in that regard um, to be willing to be open to talking about the what ifs, because that was what the brands needed to hear. I think too, a lot of, you know, like you said, a lot of the people working for these brands are perhaps not equine industry people. They're from other industries and they're experts in their field. And that has to do more with them looking at metrics and basing decisions off of metrics, right? And I think maybe it's the case that a lot of these horse shows couldn't provide a number for their email list or an open rate for their emails. And all of those sort of digital marketing pieces that 
would go into their backup plan had they sort of configured it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think, um, you know, I advise a lot of horse or a lot of brands on whether or not to participate with different events, to be honest. And so um, there were a lot of events uh, with the brands I advise that I put the kibosh on when I was sent over, like, should we participate in this event um, or not? It was canceled in 2020 and it's in early 2021. And I said, well, you know, let's ask what they're going to do if they don't have spectators and these things are kind of getting the bang for your buck. And a lot of them couldn't come back with solid answers. And so for me, it was too risky. Um, the ones that could that said, then we're going to give you a front row spot on our live stream. And this is how many viewers our live stream has. And it's going to be on horse and country TV all over the, not only in the U S but all over there. And we're going to send out a newsletter. And I was all in on, it was a yes for me on those. Um, so I think to yeah. that with events, um, is something that we saw a lot of certain ones be able to kind of knock it out of the park and get uh, companies so excited because I did see that brands were still spending that money and still spending that budget it just was going somewhere else yeah absolutely um well I think that was all the questions that came in I'll do kind of a last call to the chat if anybody wants to type very quickly um <laughs> oh yep one more coming in <laughs> and while that's coming in to you guys um my information um is here um, my email is just frankie at athletics.com and you can feel free to, um, you know, shoot questions to Strider and they can give you my info if you don't have it or, um, check out our website, which is just athletics.com and any info inquiries from there I get, um, and can see, or you can shoot me an email. I know that this is a lot of information to digest and I'm more than happy to answer anyone's questions. Um, if you think of them later as well. Okay. Oh, there was one more question. Um, when should a rider start looking for sponsorship? Yeah. So I think that really depends like, um, kind of like when you feel that you have something to offer, like, or when you're needing to offset those costs hugely. Um, I think, you know, there's better timing than others. Like if you've just had an event that went really well or, I just had a person I was advising and they had a YouTube video go viral. So, you know, they wanted to reach out and kind of capitalize on that a bit or, um, you know, there's no perfect time. It's really, um, you know, when, when you can kind of put that stuff together, but definitely don't rush it, like have it put together professionally and then send it out. Um, and then don't be afraid to follow up. And in terms of, you know, the calendar of when timing wise in annually, for every brand, it's different. I would say, um, you know, doing October, November is really a good time for brands that are then making their decisions for the next calendar year with sponsored riders. Um, but you just need to make sure that you're following up a ton. And if if you contact a company and you, you get an answer from them and they say, we're not interested this time, I always say, thank you so much for your time. And, you know, is there, or we're not looking at any riders at this time. Thank you so much for your time. Is there a, a time when you guys will be looking next? Um, because that's great insight. And you can, like I said, on that notes or document, kind of make a note there to follow up back with them. Um, yeah. Because for every company, it's just, it's different. Absolutely. Okay. Two more questions and then, <laughs> and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, so this one is great. Um, it came from a, a brand representative. So as a brand, what can we do to support our sponsored riders? And what do you find to be the most effective ways for us to reach out to potential riders? So for brands, what I really think is so important, we do a ton of advising just on helping brands kind of outline their sponsored rider program. So you really want to first figure out kind of ideally how many riders you want to work with so that you're not sending tons of riders things and you're not able to track how they're doing or what they're contributing back to you. Um, and so what I suggest is, you know, the things that you can do as a brand to support those riders are really, you know, share their successes, share their social media and communicate with them. Um, for example, you know, be very clear on things that would be helpful, um, reach out. And what I see a lot of times is 
riders that don't have representation or people helping them with brands, they maybe are great if the brands just ask. So just don't be afraid as a brand to say, hey, can we get some recent pictures or um, the more clear and concise you can be as a brand reaching out to a rider, the better, especially if it's a rider you have an established relationship with. So, you know, or say, we'll send this saddle pad, but we'd love to get three video testimonials or three photos or whatever that is. As clear as you can be, the better. And then, you know, don't assume that a rider hates your product or isn't a great ambassador, but, you know, definitely spend the time to get the most out of the relationship by then contacting the rider and saying, Hey, just wanted to follow up. Can I get those photos? Um, another really important thing I think too, as a brand real quick is to establish quickly, um, the best way that the riders communicate in today's day and age, even <laughs> a lot of riders don't have computers. <laughs> so ask them, you know, do you communicate best via text? Are you an emailer? Um, things like that. It's always kind of on the intake forms. I suggest for brands I'm advising that they have, you know, what's the best way to communicate with you and then ask those riders to, you know, interact with you guys and get you content. Those are really smart tips. Just set, set the parameters. <laughs> just follow up. Just um, don't be afraid to ask them, hey, can you send this over? Usually if you do that, you'll be successful. Yeah. Um, and how much time, like how many hours per week or hours per month should a rider sort of budget or set aside to interact with their sponsors? Um, do you think it really depends on the sponsor? Do you think that it What's the best practice there? I think it really, really depends on how many sponsors you have. <laughs> if you have two sponsors, <laughs> it's a lot quicker than if you have 25. Um, but I think by sponsor, I would just, you know, a general thing for me is look at what they've asked for, the sponsors asked for, and then figure out how you're going to go above and beyond that. So if they've asked for two posts a month, try to do three or four and whatever works the best for your timing if that's, you know, I just think you have to set aside time as a rider that you're allocating to get that done because the days come and go very quickly and, you know, a horse gets sick or this happens. We all have been there in the equine world. Somebody gets cast and then your morning went to hell. <laughs> um, but just, you know, plan a day. That's why I mentioned like, you know, Monday after a show or whatever that is, get in the habit of having a time where you just, you know, check in with them quickly, send them a few things. Um, and, you know, like, and comment on their stuff and, and stuff like that. So that takes obviously different amounts of time for different people, for different brands, but I would definitely every month try to do some kind of outreach. And then another thing that I didn't mention, but it's hugely, hugely important to me is thanking your sponsors at the end of the season. Um, I always suggest doing like a photo montage or card, like a personal card, something and sending it to them. It's it's so important. I think it's something that, um, in today's day and age, for whatever reason, has been like a lost art to say thank you, but, um, make sure to kind of do that as well. Absolutely. Well, on that note, thank you for joining yeah. us and for <laughs> leading the discussion and answering all these questions. Absolutely. Um, and if, as I said, if you guys think of anything else, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and I'm here to help however I can. And Frankie is super, super helpful. And she practices what she preaches. She's amazing at email communication. So yeah. <laughs> well, thank you guys um, for having me and, and um, I appreciate it as well. So yeah, thank you. And thanks so much, everyone. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye.